seem, seem to have, I guess even internationally to a great extent, iconic uh, ideas about you know leaders. We always think of a person standing behind a dais, that's the leader. Is that something that you are sort of beginning to change in your organizations? Or perhaps how you could share with us? You're absolutely right, and let me also allude to that point. Uh, today, with uh, the technology that's available, uh, ideas come from everywhere. What is required for leaders today is to listen, because uh, things happen around you all the time. People are critiquing you, people are noticing you, every one of your actions is watched, and uh, there are so many ideas coming, so many blogs, so many social networking sites, and if you care to listen, I think you can pick up, you don't need too many ideas, because anyway you can't chase all of them, you need only very few. But there are a lot of ideas that's coming from uh, your own employees and also from uh, public at large. I think it's a, it's a very, very, very important uh, skill uh, that everyone needs to develop. Uh, because it's told to you. Previously, we conduct a poll. You had to ask people. Right. Now, you don't have to ask people. It just pushed to you. It hits you. Okay, so you just have to be... Uh, Able to handle that. So I know your, your bank is seeing young leaders, including you, and I remember Mr. Vagul stepping back when Mr. Kamath was put ahead, and vice versa for you as well. In that, in that sort of philosophy or that idea, how are you trying to build further leaders and promote the whole middle management, which seems to always appear that as if it's stagnating from everyone's point of view or not getting the real chance? Uh, there are two things that really drive it. One is <coughs> the fact that you know, the economy is growing at such a fast pace and therefore the corporations are growing at such a fast pace that it just offers that many more opportunities mm -hmm. to give people that leadership responsibilities. You know, finally, you know, you don't give them just a, a big title, but you really give them huge uh, leadership responsibilities at younger and younger ages, and that is what creates more leaders. Uh, the second thing is that I think large organizations have to stop looking at leadership as just a noun. I think leadership is as much a noun as a verb. You know, it's not just a set of characteristics. You have to look at set of behaviors. You, you may not be able to identify so many uh, characteristics which are very different at a young stage, but behavior is very visible. Uh, you know, the set of actions that people take to continuously drive uh, the organization and how do they harness ideas, get people to work, and you know, put ideas in place and so on. Uh, that's that's how you keep identifying more and more leaders. So a process, not a position. I think that's a, that's a very interesting aspect of what you said. But Dr. Norya, India seems to be. In find more and more leaders. So a process, not a position. I think that's a, that's a very interesting aspect of what you said. But Dr. Norya, India seems to be in a unique position. You were talking about competitive access and potential shift towards countries like India, China. Obviously, it looks like we have so much more potential, but not enough recognized leaders to deliver it. Is that something that we'll face as a challenge? So I think the capacity for leadership in this country is immense. I mean, as Chanda pointed out, I mean, this is a uh, one of the great strengths of India is this young population and a young population that is becoming increasingly imaginative, uh, that has discovered the possibility of its own leadership, that has a sense of self-imagination that I think is growing every day. So I am very optimistic that if the leaders on this stage provide the kind of opportunities that they're talking about uh, and actually do that, uh, then this capacity for leadership in the middle will grow much more rapidly than anyone might imagine. So. The, the possibility of creating an amazingly healthy ecology of leadership in this country is immense. Uh, I do think that another thing that Indian companies will have to think about is uh, to actually be quite open to also inviting people from other countries into this talent mix, mm -hmm. right? So India is a very large country and sometimes our sense is that we have enough ourselves. Uh, so we don't need to have in our, in our companies leaders from any other part of the world. But as, as large a country as we are and as much intellectual talent as there is in, the in this country, we don't have an intellectual monopoly. So I actually think that one of the great challenges that Indian companies are gonna face in the next time ahead is to create an ecology in which people who are leaders from other parts of the world can also exercise leadership in these countries. That they can be Mexicans and they can be Japanese and they can be Chinese and they can be Americans and they can be Europeans who equally feel at home in a great Indian company as today. There are Indians, Chinese, and Japanese who feel at home at IBM or feel at home in another great global company. But are promoters going to feel like that? Because you're familiar with how the Indian economy functions. I mean, our, 
uh, majority of our billionaires uh, are promoted as in uh, you know people who are driving. But I think they want to remain billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so if is if that why they? So, 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 so if they want to remain billionaires, uh, they will also be very good at discovering what the competitive imperative is. If the competitive imperative for these companies will be a recognition that in a world of open source, in a world of innovation where ideas come from everywhere, the winning companies will be able to harvest and bring together uh, great people and great talent from all over the world, then I think that the very promoters who want to make sure that they remain billionaires, I hope will be equally open-minded about bringing this talent into their companies as well. It's a very important point that he's making in terms of, we've been talking about global talent. Now let's try and get the talent that we need wherever that's available in the world. Yeah. Now the, the fact of this globalization is all about <coughs> developing this kind of a global model. Now is it just talent? What kind of talent? If you look at leadership talent, can it be integrated with the local leadership talent that we have? What about innovation? There's innovation happening everywhere. Can we integrate that? So there is a new breed of leaders that is required. We're very, very comfortable operating in this kind of a global environment who are empowered. You know, the, the key word is to empower them. Mm. Take the risk. Look at this fostering the culture of innovation. That's something that has to happen bottom up and up down. Well, I think the way ideas come out is that you have to encourage people who are absolutely close to the customer to tell you what the customer mm. wants. Because otherwise, the organizations tend to get into a tendency of selling to the customer what you can make. But what you have to make is what the customer wants. And therefore, you know, the basic ideas really come from those who are close to the customer. The other challenge for the leader is mm. to make sure that you don't create an anarchy. You know, that, that's, that's the other important part of leadership is, you know, otherwise we can go all over with many ideas, not many of them implemented. So it's important also to make sure that you prioritize and really keep delivering as well and not just having ideas floating around. So there? I think I want to make two points. Um, innovation is not about creating a department for innovation. Innovation is, has to be in the DNA yeah. and really create a culture. So it, it takes a lot of effort. By just uh, creating a bunch of people, and giving them a title of uh, uh, innovation group, nothing will happen. The second part is, at least in TCS, what we do, we leverage technology uh, tremendously. We have created a platform whereby anything about which we want ideas, uh, we can post, and all the 140 percent people, it can, it can be made open to, and it gets voted. People give ideas, people vote ideas, and then you can, or you can see everything, and you can filter it up so that that most voted ideas. <laughs>
out of India, the next Google, or the next Facebook, uh, or, or the next iPad. company, like, the next <laughs> iPad, or a company like that. I think that uh, Indian IT industry has clearly emerged to the point where its next ambition should be to create something that will be a global household product and an innovation that uh, will be something that, that the world will, will come to. So that's the question that I would pose for them. And what preparation are you making that will allow you to deliver from India uh, a global product that will end up capturing the imagination of people, not just in India, but all over the world? Sandra? I think the, uh, uh, Nitin, you know this uh, more than anyone else. Innovation happens where there is a problem. Okay, you can't sit here and solve the U.S. market and then expect that the best innovation uh, is going to happen here for the U.S. market. So now, luckily, we are at a stage that the opportunity that India presents, both in terms of the problems that we need to solve uh, and also the readiness of the industry and the scale that we have, I think the time is right. The next innovation, I pretty, pretty much feel, will come from India, especially... Uh, areas around sophisticated applications on cloud. We talked about it this morning, how cloudy is cloud. Uh, it's not cloudy at all. Um, the sophisticated innovations will come from India. I don't know who will make it, but many will come. And you're going to see it in the next few years. Do you think we'll be ready with something that will soon become a mascot of Indian innovation? I mean, all of this put together collectively will then be able to uh, put out we, a big thumbs probably, up. Probably. I would think that in the intersection of financial services, technology, unique identification, etc., there is a great opportunity. This is an opportunity that's unique to us because we can build a scalable model that addresses the issues of 200 million, 300 million consumers in a yeah. very, very efficient manner. Okay. Any system that delivers you know, value, a, a person with an ID card can go to a local Kirana and take cash, is phenomenal. Dr. Noya, this is the tough one, a question to a banker. Is there a way, again, that we can certainly everybody, one opportunity that is very clear, but I know that ICICI is working uh, very hard on it, is to genuinely create products that reach the rural poor, even though this has been an opportunity that has now been identified for more than a decade. I think you would very soon see a lot of innovations where genuinely the Indian banking sector will try and cover the 600,000 villages, uh, you know, villages with less than 2,000 uh, population uh, per village, and uh, people who are living at about say two dollars a day, uh, not even ten dollars a day. And why I feel confident that the Indian banking industry will be able to do it now and did not do it earlier, because I think a lot of enabling factors have now, have now come together. Uh, you know, connectivity has spread all over the country. Uh, the mobile telephony technology is coming of age. Uh, there are the smart card products that have come of age. Uh, the uh, various regulatory, uh, you know, kind of uh, approvals and processes have been put in place. But one thing we need to come full circle on, Dr. Norris, while we keep thinking about our billionaires making up on those lists, we could well go two steps behind if we don't take that big leap forward. Excited as we are, and I certainly having grown up in India, I'm excited about everything that India has accomplished. I think it will be very important for us to recognize that the slope of what it takes doesn't get easier. The slope actually gets harder. And one has to work even harder in India to, to remain successful and to capture the opportunity that is clearly there to be had by India, by China, by many other places in the world. So I would urge everybody in Indian business to be innovative, to continue to rise to the channel challenge, to almost be paranoid about the success that they've had rather than to be so exuberant about the success that they've had, and to recognize that it's that small sense of paranoia that maybe this will not last, that will in fact be the spur, that will allow them to continue to be competitive, that will allow them to continue to be innovative, and continue to succeed in this amazing battleground of global competition that is emerging and will continue to intensify in the years ahead. That, that's the hope that everybody here is going to go out with. The leadership is not by appointment, but as a routine process of excellence, and that's something that everybody has to keep in their lives daily, every minute, every second. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Noria. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you very much. Markets will come to a standstill. Investment decisions postponed. Presenting ET Now Market Summit 2010.